Okay, for our main presentation this evening, we're going to be having Greg, KO6TH, tell us about uh, what is APRS, how to use it, some hands-on, and uh, let's, let's see what you got for us, Greg. Thank you very much, everyone. Greg, KO6TH. Okay, um, the last slide in the deck is the one that Joe mentioned ahead of time. It's going to be the punchline. He's already kind of spoiled it. This is not WinLink. WinLink is a totally different idea, totally different concept, different, just different. This is APRS. This, so to start with, the presentation is one I stole from Bob Berninga, posted on his website. Um, he's used it, he was on a mission, he still is on a mission, uh, to rid the world of trackers. Because all of APRs is going to trackers, everybody wanting to track their car. And it's more than that, a whole lot more. <coughs> it is about, well, a, the P in, in, in APRS is not packet, it's not position, it's packet. Automatic packet reporting. And so the idea is um, real time, understanding of, of the world. And uh, it's, it's, it's all about two-way, it's messaging, it's just all that real-time stuff, all that stuff that the well, link isn't. Um, so I'm gonna read this, I'm not supposed to read slides, but I'm gonna read this so that people understand. Um, immediate, local, digital, and graphical information exchange, right? Between well, all stations, objects, status of all stations, messages, bulletins, announcements, weather data, telemetry, uh, direction finding bearings, signal strengths, RF connectivity, local objects, local frequencies, IRL, P, echo, link, etc., for use with routine awareness, marathons, races, except Joe's, um, events, public service, search and rescue, family communications, mobile-to-mobile, -mobile global text messaging, weather data exchange, and efficient multi-user satellite communications. Now, that seems like a little bit of a stretch, but he could do that. The scope of APRS is an old map, and it's more than just the United States, it's worldwide. Um, but it's everywhere, it's all over the place, it's everything. And it is just simply the connection between RF clients. So you've got a hand up. So here's the DH7, right? This is the one on the, on the left there. The one on the right, this is an old slide, right? From uh, it's a D7, it's a uh, 7100, 7000. 7100. Um, and it's all built on this UI frame. The UI frame is unnumbered information. There's no connection, no, from a radio protocol perspective, there's no automatic retries, no automatic stuff. It just, you blast the packet out and hope it arrives at the other end. And they, they do it a couple of times to kind of, kind of want to make sure. So Joe, when he wants to do his, you know, emergency communication from someplace, this is the tool for you. Because it's kind of, you know, you throw a packet in there and you hope it gets there. It will eventually. But it's not something you want to, you know, risk your life on. But it's very effective for what it does. Um, the messaging system, if you dig in, you see, and follow me here. You see all this gobbledygook for packets. That's the information that's behind all this stuff. And they've got a, a set of formats for it's all defined in terms of how it, it uh, how you organize the packets. Bob is incredibly bit efficient, not byte efficient, bit efficient, and in, in packs the stuff into his, in his frames. But it's all this just built on these, these frames that they go flying around. And an infrastructure that hides it all together. You can go, ah, I've got a new toy. You can go from handheld all the way to handheld or mobile. You can go via Digipeter, right? You bounce off a of Digipeter for your packets. Um, you can do it off of satellites. I've done this. It's fun. Um, then they have this whole new thing down here, which is the internet system, APRS IS which is the mythical cloud, it's a big database of stuff, it's distributed, it's reliable, it's redundant, all that kind of thing. And um, packets can go through internet gateways into this 
database, and then there are these services that watch what's going on and react to the data that's coming through. It also forwards it off from eye gate to eye gate out to other things. So I can, from my handheld sitting, you know, in Auburn, I can send a message through this whole system, have it come out somewhere in Germany. No big deal. Choose choice. Um, objects are a big deal on on um, APRS. There's these maps. Think Harry Potter and the Marauder's Map. That's all you need to know. That's what it is, right? Status and information about where everybody is in real time. Um, you can dig into things. You can get all kinds of information. Let me do this two-handed. Uh, there's a WA3 ELA. It's a weather station. Temperature 64.9. Humidity 74%. percent or seven percent That was back in 2007. Um, you can watch packets bounce off of things. K6FGA-1. Um, up there on top is the uh, area high-level digi. You want to bounce a packet off something, you're probably bouncing off of that. Off of that. Um, okay, there is a place for trackers. Balloons. This is an old slide. They're down to a matter of grams now for flying the, uh, the APRS um, transmitter. And they run these things. You, in 2009, took off somewhere east of uh, Visalia, I think. Uh, somewhere down in Southern California, we're halfway to Bakersfield, and um, ran this thing up to 30,000 feet and back down to the ground and tracked it the whole way. Easy to pick it up that way. Telemetry. There's my house. Temperatures and humidity um, and dew point over the past uh, two days, if you're curious. You can look it up on the, on the internet. Um, stations. Okay, you guys have equipment. You've got these lightweight trackers, like in the balloons, some people put them in their cars. They just transmit every 30 seconds or whatever, feed out a packet. The problem with the, the ones that don't receive isn't so much that there's no display on them, it's they aren't listening for the traffic. They just put the packet out when it's their time. And they can collide with somebody else. You know, you, you never, it's, it's kind of unreliable from that perspective. Uh, handhelds, I couldn't find an icon. They seem to be hidden in the sand on this one. Um, Ken Wood Yesu, I think, I think Olympus got one, um, or for doing um, APRS. Um, in the shack, there's all kinds of solutions besides the TNC and computer. Um, I mean, you've got um, um, internet mobile, right? Yeah. Cell phone, yeah. Those work pretty well. Um, so all kinds of ways to, uh, to connect any place, any time out in the middle of nowhere, bounce a packet off the International Space Station. I sent myself email once from my front yard, bouncing it off the ISS, just because. Services, okay. You've got that thing in the cloud, and so they, they have people that put up these little servers that watch the, the packets flying by. They see one, that's two, email two. Well, there's no <coughs> ham station email two, so Grab that and oh, it's an email message. Package it up, for it off to the internet. And so from the middle of nowhere, like my front yard, I can bounce a packet off the space station, aim it at email two, and my phone beeps <laughs> with, with my email message. Uh, There's also a uh, gateway. Besides the um, uh, email system, there's the, the, small, the, the SMS small message system. Uh, the, the, the old, uh, the old um, uh, cell phone messaging, uh, and even one for predicting satellite passes, which I was going to demo tonight, but unfortunately, I can't get an RF signal out of here, so we'll not do that part. Um, <coughs> this, the email two, actually, there was an email one, an email with no suffix. That one seems to be turned off. But email two seems to still work. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, this predates. So, we, so Hams had instant messaging, what, a decade before the internet, before Twitter? Past predictions. So when you send a message to your satellite, text doesn't matter, and you get back a reply with the next pass. 
It's pretty cool. I tried this one last, uh, not this past year, but the previous year on Joda. They have it, this is one of the servers out in the cloud. You send the message to CQ, and it acts then as a reflector for your call sign. So people sending to that get reflected back to you, and you can join in this big conversation. The idea was you send a message to CQ Joda, and uh, you get connected to the world. We got nothing that, that year. I don't know why I wasn't using the right, I guess. And in theory, that, that, can, that can be a great, uh, great tool. Um, Bob is very efficient with bits. He's also pretty clever. When you're driving down the road, you want to you have your, your, your radio on 5-2, right? 146-5-2, calling frequency. You never hear anything. Because of what, why? Everybody else is doing the exact same thing. They're just waiting for someone to call on 5 too. Well, someone's got to call. So you sit there every every minute. You've got to pick up your microphone and say, hey, hello, anybody there? Kind of, kind of hard to do when you're driving. So what Bob's done is he said, okay, tell you what. Let's put on a PLD code on your APRS machine. Turn the volume up instead of down. And now anybody who's got their radio with PL encode on as they're driving by you, you'll hear their packet decoded. Rap, right? There's somebody there. You pick up your mic and call. Did you see their call sign right on the screen? And if, if you're if you're automated or not doing all this kind of stuff, you turn your PL off and you never hear it. Old slide, but there's Bob in the middle. That's Bob Berninka. Um, with one of the, he's um, a something professor kind of person at the Naval Postgraduate uh, place over in the East Coast. Okay, deep dive. Um, <laughs> how many people have a, a D74? Ooh, we got a few. How many have not bought a D74 because it's $500? <laughs> Listen up for the next couple of slides and you see why it's worth $500. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, just to set one up, call sign, data band speed, a few things uh, that just for time I'll, I'll skip here. But um, basically, you just, it's a couple things you got to configure. And um, then you go to the message menu and you can send a message to call sign. So you can call sign plus SSID. So, you know, KO6TH 7 is, is my, uh, my D74. Or to the service. So you send it to, the, to ISS. You put your message in there, 67 characters. This is like Twitter. You don't put a book in there. Um, hit send, and off it goes. What you get back, or when you have your, your radio just sitting there running, you'll see these, these messages, these things pop up, um, that, hey, you know, K, so if anybody knows this guy, um, K1RLR, he's down by Mather Field somewhere. He's, he's beaconing about every 10 seconds. It's like way too often, or not quite that, but every 20 seconds. It's less than a minute. But anyway, you'll see it, this thing pops up. You'll see a call sign. What is that status is information. So a whole bunch of stuff that pops up on the first screen. Hit the little, the little right arrow. And you find out that he's um, 307 degrees from where I am, or what was when I did this. So that's, uh, what, uh, a little bit north of, of west. Uh, and 29.9 miles away, elevation 112 feet. You go a little bit further, next screen here, we have this funny compassy thing, which says, you are aimed north, you're moving southeast, he's moving northwest, you're going to miss each other. Okay, really important for search and rescue, or just meeting up with somebody. And then information here about where he's located, uh, GPS coordinates, that kind of stuff, so you can hand off to uh, other responders. So a whole bunch of information just on that first four screens. And then, just to make things more interesting, it knows what's going on. So if you have a, uh, a packet that's got frequency information in it, what, 442.7, right? There's a button you can push on yours to D74, QSY to M. Pretty good. Objects, you can send objects out. Every 30 minutes, I think it is, every 10 minutes, um, from my home station, I beacon where the K1 
A6, A, uh, W6TK repeater is, with the frequency of the tone, uh, the nets are to Thursday at 17.30, um, and the whole information is right there. For anybody passing through on the freeway, they'll see that. Oh, there's a, there's a, there's a ham station, a ham club around here. They have a net tonight, I think I'll join. Weather stations get decoded. So if you go to KO60H-15 now, I'm just turn it on for RF, uh, it'll decode the temperature and humidity of everything else uh, at my house. And uh, if you're an eye gate, uh, the station that feeds from RF to the internet, it, it, has, it decodes uh, power height and gain so you get an idea of the, of the coverage. So a little bit deep dive into that email thing. Uh, email to, so email to, e, email to is the uh, to, you put your text, you put your email address in, and then the message, you hit send. You get an acknowledgement from the eye gate saying, hey, I got your thing, I forwarded it on. And then what comes out on the other end is your message. And then all stuff from do not reply on now is basically an ad for the, for the not ad, but it's information about the, um, uh, internet server that uh, peak uh, W, what is this call sign? Anyway, uh, 84PL uh, is the one who set this thing up. So he's, he's advertising his, uh, or showing you where you can find more information about that station. But there's the message right there in email. You can also do it to SNS, the old simple message system. The neat thing about this one is it's two way. So from my D74, I can send a message to my phone number, saying test message. I get an acknowledgement from the gateway, and on my phone, it says test message. I say, got it, as a reply, and my Kenwood beeps at me with the message. It all happened within like less than a minute. So it's really fast, and it's bidirectional. You have to start with the RF first, security, and so that the system knows where your D74 is, to so set throughout the message. Um, if you want to send a message off the ISS, you don't send it to Y1-1 Y1 or Y2-1. Uh, you got to do it to, uh, to ARISS, <coughs> the, uh, the VIA. And we're on 145.825 to keep it off of the national packet frequency because otherwise it would be swapped. You wouldn't hear anything. Don't acknowledge because it's not likely to get through. Remember, it's just guess. And uh, send, a, send a CQ out and see who comes back to you. And this is what the demo is going to be for the past prediction. Send a message to ISS and get back this kind of cryptic thing. AOS 46N16S NW SW Barrow 70. Okay, that decodes to the next pass will start in 46 minutes and 16 seconds. This pass starts from the northwest, peaking to the southwest at an elevation of 70 degrees, ending in the southeast. Total pass time 11 minutes. There's a lot of information in there. And this is the, the guy who put this server together is the author of the APRS software on the JNX, on the Indefinite device over in uh, Florida. So there's, there's, and the format changes a little bit depending on how far out the, uh, uh, the pass is. And that works for ISS. Works for you know all the just by the satellite name, so Echo 29, etc. It'll, it'll pick it up. Okay, APRS IS32. I'm not going to do the demo so much. Um, this is a you've heard of a UIU. It's like that was that was the pack or the APRS station software from way back when. The author of it, Randy, passed away a number of years ago. Part of his will was that the source was going to be destroyed, which it was. So there's no more maintenance on the software. Uh, he did that intentionally to get things to be moving along. Lynn, um, uh, I get a small side now, um, and in Florida, came up with the APRS IS-32. He started it on one of these. This is a Windows 5. Windows Mobile 5. Um, 
least it was good for something. <laughs> it was, it, yeah, it was good for something. It, it actually worked pretty well. The thing that this did, this is not a beefy platform. There's a small squirrel in here. Um, so he had to be very efficient on his coding. And it runs pretty well on this little, on this little thing. The other neat thing is that the, the API that he's writing to in this thing is the Win32 API. That's what Microsoft did back then. It's the same API as Windows Desktop. So guess what? Turn a compile flag really easy, and you come up with the, uh, the Windows version of the software, which is really, really popular and very full, full featured. This is kind of a, it's a little bit weird configuring. When you first start it up, you've got to zoom over and zoom into where you are and hit the transmit button to say, okay, I'm, I'm there. And then after that, it kind of takes off. It's an I gate by default. So if you have an RF connection, it'll I gate you in. And I am bi directional, like you enable it. There's enable flags and stuff. This um, website up here, uh, APRS ISCE, CE is the, uh, the Windows Mobile thing. Um, so WINS is a verb, WINS CE. Um, APRS ISCE.wiki.com. Everything is in there, download for the software, all that kind of stuff. Really easy to use. The map is this big, you know, the usual map thing is it's um, uh, it's not Google, it's, it's open open street maps, what it's based on. Um, and you can zoom in, you know, way down to the, the detail level, also way out to the, the planet. Um, it's a moving map display, so just like the Marauders map from Harry Potter. And stations would be popping up if I had a live internet connection and it does not look like it is doing so. So I'm going to skip that part. And then messaging from here, you can connect either through the internet to send a message or um, I have the small laptop there. If you want, maybe after the uh, uh, meeting's over, you can come up and I'll, I'll show you the, uh, uh, the connections to D74 for Bluetooth. And then from there, you can send a message over RF. Uh, so you can do that. <coughs> APRS.fi is probably the best place to go if you're looking just on the online only version of, of the world. Um, it's, it, it ties directly into that big database. You can do data mining, you can dig in, find out what's going on, click on stations, see where they've been, where they're, you know, kind of where they're, not where they're going, but which direction they're going. Um, it's not, people keep using it as a tool for doing um, propagation studies and, you know, what's my path. By design, APRS uh, throws away dupes, duplicate packets, so only the first one wins. And because of that, it's not really a good tool for that, but people still, still kind of try to use it. Um, and it's got more than APRS in it. The weather stations, the CWOP, the weather stations are there, uh, and AIS. So the Costco Boston boat I took this this afternoon. It's headed out toward, I'm guessing Hawaii, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Real time. Anybody who thinks the port of of, of um, San Francisco is losing to the port of Oakland, zoom in on the bay. It's definitely in San Francisco. Okay. Last year we did an experiment, um, and the um, a cystic fibrosis run, which is coming up. Um, it's, it's not uh, scheduled so far this year. Oh, really? Ooh, no. Okay. Looks like it's going to be in Santa Rosa. Ooh, okay. So, if we had one, we we're going to try it again. But um, we did last year. Having bicycles running around the foothills is a bit of a, not bicycles, but um, the, the uh, sad wagons. It's a little difficult to drive, operate your radio, and try to, you know, keep track of what's going on. So, we thought we'd try this with smartphones and an APRS application. Uh, on them just to beacon out where they are. And so at net control, I had that moving map display, and I could see where all the, all the uh, sad wagons were. I could see the folks coming to the site and missing their exit. Who was that? Who it was? Uh, Lee, I think. Anyway, um, I could, here's the exit. He could run them right on by, <laughs> call them, say, hey, turn around. Um, so it's really, really good tool for having a view at NCS of what's going on with, with the event. Um, you can send any message back and forth because the driver is not going to be you know, trying to just take messaging on his phone. Um, the RF worked pretty well. We'd fill in where the cells didn't 
So a pretty good, you know, good combination of the two. Um, and uh, I would recommend, highly recommend doing this in the future. And then, I slide for, for Joe. APRS is all about real time. It's all about uh, communication, status, information, tactical stuff. Um, WinLink is also a messaging system, but it's not that real time thing. It's designed to be reliable. It's what they use for disasters. It's what, um, we talked to Greg, um, KG6SJT, uh, used it very effectively uh, in the, uh, the campfire, also up in, uh, in Reading, uh, with the, um, the, the fire up there, uh, to get messages out of that area into the internet uh, that could be delivered. Very effective for that, very reliable. <coughs> uh, you can have attachments, you can have, you know, within reason, that can send more at peace, but you can, you can send information over the, this, this, uh, this uh, tool very effectively, and it's not real time. Or maps. or maps. That's all I have for today. Anybody has any questions? Or, right. In this day and age where we try to keep anonymous and not give our information out, where we are, where what we're doing, why would you put something out that anybody could access through all these different mode? Like, why would I hide my mind? in your house, what's your exact location? So, Two answers to that. One is anything you do in ham radio is public anyway. I mean, I did hide my, or obfuscate my cell phone, phone number because it's going to get posted. But um, the other side of it, though, is with positioning on APRS, you can, you can put in, uh, it's called ambiguity. You can, you can say, my location is here, sort of. You can, you can, you can define an area that you're within that area, but you, but you can't tell where you are within that area. So the fuzz is it. But it's publicly posted, correct? It's Only the fuzz like version. Point to point. Not your actual version. Not your actual, um, uh, it, it, I don't think, even when it leaves your radio, it's already, at that point, uh, rounded off. So you, you, your location isn't exact unless you want it to be. And then, and then the messages, it's in radio, it's public. And if you're worried about it, no news. And if you're worried about it, don't use it. Yeah, and, and, and I think, Joe, the, the, the WinLink messages, they are encrypted. They're not encrypted, they're, but they're also not plain text. No, yeah, they're, they're compressed. They're compressed, OK. All right, Greg, have you heard of the actual <clears throat> origins of APRS? This There's a story the there that I'd love to hear. 30 years? <laughs> yeah, so. Um, the rumor is. And Brudiga, I believe he was a professor or something at Naval Academy, if I'm not mistaken. And his wife didn't like all the time he was spending on ham radio. She'd come home and he was just in his radio room. So he devised a tracker, stuck it on her car. And he could see when she was coming home and put off her radio sign off and say, Hi dear, how you doing? I told you he was clever. Are they still married? <laughs> you should see a picture of his car. So Bob, Bob, um, he's into more than just ham radio. Uh, his car, he has a, a, an old, it's a, it's a Prius that he's dug into. Um, he needed a source of power out in the field and um, decided, well, I've got a 300 volt battery, 200 volt battery, whatever it is in there. I'll take, and you, know, you look at an inverter, the first thing it does is, or uh, a power supply, first thing it does is it, it, it rectifies the 110 coming in, turns it into about 200, 300 volts DC, and then drives 12 volts out of that. So he just kind of chopped the thing off and plugged it into his car. Battery, the main, the, you know, the, the high voltage battery and he's got 12 volts at whatever he wants to pull out of it, and whenever the main battery goes down, he just, the car just kicks on and turns it back up again. So he has his pre-ups, <laughs> UPS. Um, it's just, you gotta, you gotta go, just Google him, and you'll see no end of other things he's done. <coughs> other questions? Great. Hey, thank you. Oops, I'm sorry, Joe. In the uh, APRS, 
the uh, SMS example that you had, mm -hmm. is the return path persistent? Meaning if you texted me from your radio, and then two days later I decided to respond to you, did you actually did it? Is the return path persistent? Mm -hmm. um, we could try it. I believe the answer is yes, because mm -hmm. in the manual they say part of the reason for having the RF initiated is that the return phone number is not public, and so you don't know what it is until you get that get that message. But I did get I did not get the sense that that return phone number was it like a bank of phone numbers or sort of changed. Your your radio needs to be in the system in terms of a re recent position packet. So you need to beacon so that the, the RF side of the world, the I gates, can send back to you. Okay. I think other than that it should be I'm guessing now they may age things out. Yeah. I'm but uh, try. We, we can try you know, I, 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 I try this afternoon, I'll try again tomorrow, see if it, it's still there. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know what any reason why it wouldn't be. More questions, Brian. Yeah, and I, if you are sending like an SMS, I would assume that the person you're sending it to also would need to be licensed to send it back. I mean, what's the legality of that? Um, <coughs> you initiated the call out. The infrastructure's call sign is on the return back. So the I gate that I have at home. Ah, that's one thing I wanted to mention. Other things that, that Bob was really concerned about, the number of eye gates that are one directional, they go RF to internet only, those are going to be useless for sending a message back. So if you so it's my license that's on the line that my eye gate at home is bidirectional, as it is right now. And if it gets abused, I'll turn, I'll make it read only. But it's my license, the one that's on the return, the return path. So my license on the way out but the operator for the D7 uh, license on the way in, so they're separated. Bob? Uh, difference between ABRS and DBRS? Ah, that's yes, thank you. So, there's this DBRS thing, which is, sounds a whole lot like APRS, and you wonder what it is. And I didn't have a chance to dig into it. I was gonna ask Bob if no one asked. But since Bob asked, I'll bet. So, we had a short conversation uh, on the way over to the meeting tonight, I think you, you said DPRS is one way only. It's, a, yes. it's just like a, like a trapper. Yes. Um, so there's no receive path, and therefore it is, the words you used were um, marginally not useful or something like that? Marginally useful. Um, marginally useful if you just want to ping your location. Yeah, and, and basically it's basically useless because so of that. The way it and works that. is in, in the D-Star world, on an ICOM radio, ICOM uses DPRS instead of APRS. So if I'm driving down the road and I've got my, my D-Star radio tuned into a D-Star repeater that can hit an I-gate, it will ping, it, it picks out my GPS information and transmits that off to the I gate and it shows up in the APRS network as a as a DPRS signal. So the DPRS stations do show up in APRS.fi? Yes. But you can't do anything with them. You can't message them back or anything. Right. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Oh, no. just, just one comment. Um, when you're searching for an APR station, if you put the call sign and an asterisk after it, it'll bring up all of those, all of those nodes in the asterisk. Yeah, these the dash one, da nothing in dash one through yeah. fifteen. I just searched on you and I got your call and then dash five, dash seven, dash you know, mm -hmm. yeah. and it tells you when the last time they actually pinged the system. Right, and I can if, if I get an internet signal out, I can show you the stuff afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>